Today we today's webinar is called in Understanding Adult Numeracy, Mathematical Literacy in Adult Education. And our presenter is Dr. Anastine Hector Mason. Um, before we start, there were a couple of things that I wanted to review with you. First of all, just as a reminder, in case you haven't participated in our webinar series previously, the goal of this webinar series is to engage practitioners and researchers on topics relevant to adult educators in California. Our today's presentation is on mathematical literacy, which is also known as numeracy. And our presenter is Anastine Hector Mason, who is a senior researcher at the American Institute for Research. Dr. Hector Mason has led many adult education programs or projects for us at the American Institute for Research. Um, and most recently, she has been working on a project on mathematical literacy. Um, and here's Dr. Hector Mason. OK, great, great. Um, thanks for this wonderful opportunity to present um, some very interesting information um, to you on uh, adult numeracy, um, what's called mathematical literacy in the United States. Um, as you know, although numeracy plays a, a very, very important part of students' ability to transition to college, in the United States there is very limited um, information about what numeracy is, um, how, you know, what professional development opportunities available to, are available to teachers, what teachers should do in the numeracy classroom or, or in any classroom in which math um, should be offered to students. And, um, you know, I, I really welcome this opportunity. There's a lot of information that has been developed over the last, uh, I would say, six years um, at AIR, at, at the American Institute for Research in Washington, D.C., and internationally. Um, so I'm, I'm very delighted to share this information with you. As you know, um, in the context of adult education, um, the current aim for the U.S. Department of Education is to help students to um, transition into college. As we know now, uh, students are receiving a lot of, um, you know, basic skills instruction. There is a new interest in um, in, in workforce, uh, preparing students with job skills. Um, and I think there is a resurgence of uh, interest in mathematics because there is a, a realization that basic skills in reading and writing alone will not help students to succeed in, in college. And, and the aim is to get them <laughs> in those doors. Um, the United States has experienced very limited attention to numeracy and very little research on how local adult education programs can teach mathematics um, or numeracy to, uh, to students in the system. And there are many, many reasons for this. Um, there is a little, uh, you know, there is very, very little agreement, and I'll show you that in this presentation, on what constitutes numeracy. What is it? What does it mean? Um, presentation to share later on. But like I said, there is little agreement on what constitutes, constitutes numeracy. There is pro-professional development in numeracy. There is little understanding on how adults, especially those with diverse characteristics, um, needs, diverse you know, backgrounds, how do they obtain numeracy skills. And there is also a lack, I think what I'll call a lack of um, alignment among the content standards and the curriculum and instruction and assessment, actually, that, that's offered to students at this time. So my presentation will, um, in, uh, there are six sections. I, I've timed them <laughs> to time myself so that we don't go over. I know that you have very busy lives. Um, we will begin with what the conception of what numeracy is. Then we will um, talk about why numeracy is relevant in adult education. We'll talk about the recent advances in numeracy in the United States, um, instructional and programmatic practices in adult numeracy. 
We're going to talk about the implications for the future, including the, 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 the uh, changes, modifications made to the CalPRO current module in adult numeracy, and also critical questions, questions that still remain despite the research that we've conducted so far. And, uh, and, and, and then we'll talk about um, some of your questions. What questions do you have? So I'm hoping that my time here is, <laughs> is going to be um, good enough. All right, look at what uh, this present, this, this slide here. Really, what is, what is numeracy? Um, numeracy has a lot of different definitions, and it all depends on the philosophies of, I would say, the proclivity of the persons that define them. The concept of numeracy started with the Crowther Report in 1959. Um, and Crowther defined numeracy as a mirror image of literacy. And he also said that it's not only the ability to reason quantitatively, but also some understanding of scientific methods and some acquaintance with the achievement of science. So when we look at that definition, we see he has attached the concept of literacy to this idea. And he has also included the whole idea of the understanding of scientific method, which, inv which involves very high level mathematic, mathematics, mathematics achievement. Um, so we're looking at two things. We, uh, you know, we're looking at basic level mathematics. But we're also looking at integrative mathematics, mathematics that we're able to use in our everyday lives, right? So there, there have several, there have been several conceptions of numeracy after this 1959 um, Crowther uh, report, which is from the United Kingdom, um, and I'll walk you through these conceptualizations. Um, this team here, Gal and at all, I'll say, for a lack of ability to pronounce the second name, um, said that the construct numeracy does not have a universally accepted definition. And neither does it have an agreement about how it differs from mathematics. So here the question arises, is numeracy mathematics? Um, according to Krause, it involves mathematics, but it's not necessarily mathematics. It's, it's a student's ability or person's ability to use math. It's not just knowing numbers, it's being able to use numbers. I'd, li I'd like you to take a look at these other definitions, and I will be walking you through several definitions. Diana Coben in number one, she's, uh, she's uh, considered the first numeracy professor in the world. She was actually given that title, and, and we were not sure if there's anyone else who, who has a title like that. Oftentimes, people would have the title of mathematics. But what's interesting about Diana Coven is that she has not studied math, but she is the first numeracy professor in the world um, because she studied numeracy um, uh, and, and how math is used, right? Not what mathematics is, but how it is used. Um, and she says, to be numerate means to be competent, confident, and comfortable with one's judgment on whether to use math in a particular situation. And if so, what math to use, how to use it, and what degree of accuracy is appropriate, and what the answer means in relation to the context. So context here is a really critical word um, to pay attention to. Um, Look at McGuire and Don O'Donohue in 2002. said, adult numeracy is a continuum that involves three distinct phases. And I would argue that Donahue, McGuire and Donahue's definition relates to the Crowther Report definition that includes both formative level mathematics and integrative level mathematics. So the formative level, that's the type of math that children learn in school, for example. Then you have the mathematical um, phase. So essentially to be numerate, one has to go through this sophisticated phase of, 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 of math knowledge, from basic math 
to map that you're able to use in the context of everyday life, like like you know, you know, using money, um, banking, to more integrated math, right? Math that you use culturally, or socially, or personally, or emotionally, um, and with number three, reflect on the definition that Diana Coven has presented, um, which speaks about being competent and confident and comfortable in mathematics. Let's look at another definition. Number three, Johnson in 1995 says to be numerous is more than being able to manipulate numbers or being able to succeed in school or university mathematics. <laughs> so um, numeracy is a critical awareness. So it's not just numbers. It is a critical awareness which builds bridges between math and the real world. So this is really, really interesting. Here again, we're looking at context. The different contexts will require different mathematics to be activated and engaged in. So, so this is really, really crucial. A lot of what these researchers are talking about is the ability to use math in context. And, and that's, this is really crucial. Now let's look at what the OECD says about mathematics. Um, it says mathematical literacy is an individual's capacity to identify and understand the role that math plays in the world and to make well-founded judgments, right? Using, again, using math in context, being able to make judgments about mathematics, being competent and confident, as Diana Coben suggested, uh, and use and engage with mathematics in ways that meet the needs of the individual's life as a constructive, concerned, and reflective citizen. Um, the four domains and sub-skills were presented in, in this, uh, in, in this uh, re research report. Um, and it involved a person's ability to use space and shape, a person's ability to, to ch change and relationships, um, quantity, and uncertainty, right? To, to make predictions, to count, to measure, to reason. These are all things that are involved in being numerate. So as you can see, being numerate doesn't only involve knowing math, but it actually involves using math and using it in context as, as is appropriate and being confident. And I'm, t I'm showing you all of this to, we're eventually going to get to the point where we look at what is being um, promoted by the U.S. Department of Education, what the new movement is regarding how to teach math. Let's look at the other competing definitions. Um, the AL, under the auspices of the OECD, says numeracy is the knowledge and skills required to manage and respond effectively to math demands in diverse situations. So context is very, very crucial when we're looking at math. Um, there is emphasis on using math in real context, including but not limited to everyday life. Uh, Gal et al. says numerate behavior is observed when people manage a situation or solve a problem in a real context. It involves responding to information about mathematical ideas that may be presented in a range of ways. It requires the activation of a range of enabling factors, um, enabling knowledge and, and processes. So these are just some definitions, and I assure you there are a lot <laughs> of other definitions that I have not included. I probably left them, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, there are about nine or ten other definitions that I haven't included. But what we know is that there are many, many definitions of what numeracy is, and they, for the most part, they're all competing. If you pay very, very close attention to what they're telling you, they're all talking to some extent about math in context being able to use mathematics in context. Um, and so that, let's now look at Equip for the Future, right, which brings us to the United States. A lot of the authors that I presented to you um, early, uh, earlier were from international regions. Diana Coben is from King's College in, 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 the, United, uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, O'Donoghue is from Ireland. Ido Gall is from Israel. Let's look at what is occurring in the United States. Equip for the Future in 2000. 
um, has a math content standard. And they said that adults should be able to use math to solve problems and to communicate. So that's what the purpose of math is, right? You should be able to understand math, apply it, define it, determine it, um, solve problems with it, and essentially communicate with it. These are general and broad standards. I, I think you might agree. Um, does anyone have any questions right now before we go to the next section? Any questions? Okay. Let's look at the National Research Council. And this is really, really crucial. And I'd like you to really pay attention to what the, the National Research Council says. And the reason is, uh, the reason I'm asking you to do this is that these are the conceptual ideas that are currently guiding the math professional development uh, materials that is being created by the Department of Education currently. So um, this is what you really need to know, right? You need to know that there are competing definitions of mathematics and that in the United States, this is what we are focusing on. We are not looking at numeracy necessarily. We're not looking at mathematics necessarily. We're looking at mathematical proficiency. That is the term that is guiding current development in mathematic, uh, mathematics in adult education. Okay? And according to the National Research Council, mathematical proficiency includes five components of strength. Com conceptual understanding, procedural fluency, strategic competence, adaptive reasoning, and productive disposition. And as I said earlier, the CalPro adult numeracy module is currently being uh, revised to incorporate these five strands. So eventually, you're, you're going to see what it looks like in the context of math teaching in California. Um, so if you can take a little 30 seconds to, uh, to read what I have on the screen here, and then we'll move to the next section. Next slide. Hey, Anna, Steve. Do the five components, because it's really, really important. It's, it's, it's the components that currently guiding uh, professional development uh, in adult education at the federal level. So I'm really glad that um, you had some extra time to focus on it. Um, so, you know, as we know in summary, regarding the concept of numeracy, there are conflicting definitions, there are conflicting paradigms, um, there are dominant approaches that, when you look at the literature, those approaches are really shaping practice in not only in the United States but internationally. And that is that numeracy is this integrative concept. It doesn't only include math, but it's used, it, it involves math used in context. So knowing a lot of numbers and algorithms and number sets and measurements, you know, it's essentially useless if you're, like EFF says, if you're unable to communicate about mathematics. And there are a lot of constructivist approaches in, in math practice. So students essentially are encouraged not only to know math, but to do math. Um, in terms of practice, there is we still know that there is very little research. And I would say very little research in the United States. I think that the UK, Australia, Ireland, you know, New Zealand, those places are very, very advanced in terms of, of, of math or numeracy practice. Um, assessments, now there are limitations all over the world regarding how to, <laughs> how to assess mathematics and where, how to assess numeracy. Um, often the current assessments we have do not, um, do not uh, really reflect the definitions that are used. And I think part of that problem is because there are just competing definitions. So no one knows really um, you know, which definition is being used. So I think that's really important to consider. Um, and also professional development. Teachers are not uh, trained on how to prepare to teach numeracy in general. And when it comes to numeracy with ELLs, I mean, that is a, just a major, major issue. They uh, compose um, or they comprise about almost 50% of, uh, you know, federal adult education programs in the United States. Um, 
when we talk about students transitioning to college, they're included in that group. And oftentimes, the focus is only on their language skills development. And you know, we don't know if, for example, if a student is showing difficulty, an ELL student is showing difficulty in, in mathematics, if it's really a math problem. Is it a math problem, or is it an ELL problem? And the same thing with AB students. When they're showing difficulties, do they have reading problems? Because we know that a lot of times students are, um, there are a lot of math problems. Hello? Okay. There are a lot of math problems. Uh, I'm sorry, there are reading problems in, in mathematics. So we have to master, students need to master reading, but also um, master reading in a way that enables them to understand math as well. Okay, let's look at section two now. Why is adult numeracy relevant in adult education? This is really um, crucial. There is a, is a legal basis for numeracy. Um, uh, and, and that's the Adult Education and Family Literacy Act of, of 1998. And it says that the term literacy, so see how broad literacy may, you know, is defined. It's not only being able to read and write anymore, but you have to be able to read, you have to be able to write, you have to be able to speak in English, um, compute, and solve problems. So as you can see here, the concept of numeracy is actually subsumed under the notion of what literacy is, right? Um, and here we're talking also about, that, you know, we're talking about being able to do all these things at the level of proficiency necessary to function in a job, um, in the family of the individual, and in society. And I would argue, of course, in college. Um, so think about, if you see here, numeracy subsumed under literacy. Recall the Crowther Report that says that numeracy is a kind <laughs> of literacy. Let's look at the next slide, which talks about another basis for numeracy. There is a socioeconomic basis for numeracy, right? Numerical thinking is required in all areas of life. When you think of banking, microeconomics, you know, shopping, paying the bills, those are numerate behaviors. There's also an educational basis for numeracy. Students who are not numerate may have a very difficult time advancing educationally. For example, how does a student graduate from college without the appropriate skills in numeracy? How do you how do you go to college and advance to grad school and to other without being able not only to, com to do basic math, but to compute in a way, as Diana Coben said in the first slide, you, you know, um, that shows that you're confident about using it, that you know how and when to use mathematics. So it's, 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 it's pretty interesting. Um, so we, we just talked about the state of mathematics in the US. There is a legislative basis for students knowing math. Um, very little math is taught, and that's from my own personal research and, you know, and, and research that I've, I've read regarding how much math is taught in, in, in a lot of the ABE classes. Um, math, as you know, is subsumed under literacy. For example, you're in a basic literacy class, and maybe they'll throw in a few math, <laughs> math classes here and there. Um, the approach to math in the U.S. is office computations, operations. Um, you know, the math is often test driven, and as you can see on the tape, the GED, the aim is to help students pass the test, the big test. Uh, you know, um, we know that math in ESOL is neglected. I would like to see a few ESOL classes um, that, that in incorporate math substantively, and if, if anyone knows about these classes, please feel free to email me because I'm interested in doing a lot of um, research on math in ESOL and haven't been able to identify a class that, uh, that, that would do that. And, and I ask you to think of the Krautos, they were the initial conception of numeracy, how it is ignored, or perhaps it's just advanced um, because the Krautos report was back in 1959. It's been a very, very long time ago that the concept was uh, created. So let's look at some recent advances. Over the last few years, despite the, the you know, the paucity in research, there have been some advances. Um, there have been professional societies that developed, you know, different content standards for, for children's mathematics. There are some uh, 
uh, organizations that develop content standards for, for, adult, for, for, for college uh, developmental mathematics. Um, we know that uh, OBE sponsored the uh, content standards. And if you go to the content standards warehouse uh, and the Office of Vocational Adult Education website, that's something that you'll find on there. There was a 2006 Adult Numeracy Initiative, which was conducted by the American Institute for Research. We completed a very comprehensive, um, very, very comprehensive and um, uh, literature review that really, I mean, it was pretty broad. And then that is something that I, actually, it's online, so I will try to get the link sent to you. But that 2006 project led the way for this new adult numeracy instruction project that is conducted by Turk in Boston. And they are, as the, the, the name suggests, the ANIPD are currently developing, they're testing some professional development initiatives now, and it will eventually share those with the field. So there is something coming. Um, we have the EFF, the Equip for the Future um, information. We have the National Math panel report, I believe that was in 2009. Um, so the focus now, remember that earlier when we talked, we talked about the three phases of math, starting from formative phase to mathematical phase and then to integrated phase. The whole focus now is on the more integrative definition of, of, of numeracy. So I'd like you to think about a few slides ago, you, you had the opportunity to re reflect on five strands. Think about those five strands within the context of a more integrative definition of numeracy, a more integrative approach to teaching numeracy. And that means not just a foundational brick, I mean, a block, you know, with number sense and, and, you know, as if math is a, you know, to be taught in discrete, um, in a discrete way. But think about math as a more in, something that in, should involve a more integration of different concepts. I hope that was clear. Please let me know if it wasn't. Um, and I see Armando here says we must strive for competency, and I agree. <laughs> um, so let's look at the principles of, of standards for school. What should math? What should math content standards? There should be the word include there, right? What should math content standards include? Okay, um, according to the principles for standards for school math, they're saying that it should include numbers, algebra, geometry, measurement, data analysis, and probability. Now the question is still, how do you teach that? Uh, and the new movement now is to teach it in an integrative way. You know, isolate numbers from algebra. And I know that's hard to do, but there are some people who believe um, in a, you know, the more discrete way of teaching math. Um, fuel instruction standards reform movement in math, and uh, fueled by, I'm sorry, the instructional standards reform movement in math and numeracy in the U.S. So there is an emphasis on conceptual understanding of math, and more emphasis, as you can see from EFF, um, problem solving, making decisions. It, it, is, it shouldn't be rule-based learning, like this is the rule, that is the rule. And if you ever have the opportunity to study ethno-mathematics, right, ethno-mathematics, you will see that there are many, many different ways of teaching mathematics. But in the U.S., there, has, there tends to be this rule-based, like this is how you do it, and you have to show me the formula. <laughs> I have an old... Uh, uh, teacher who used to say, there are many ways to skin a cat. I don't know if that's a good thing for a cat, but um, I hope I'm getting you to laugh at this point um, and wonder if you have any questions. Any questions so far? Okay. What does it mean to be mathematically proficient? I see that some words are missing from my slides. Uh, Barbara, I'm going to have to send you the new um, slide, the new presentation, because it seems like something is missing here. But what does it mean to be mathematical proficient? So we're back to those five components again. And the reason why I have you revisiting it is because when you leave this presentation, this is what you should focus on. This is what the new CalPro uh, math module is going to include. This is what you're going to be taught 
um, or in the next professional development about um, this, this is the direction that the U.S. Department of Education is going in, right? So in math proficiency. In the United States, we are looking at math proficiency from the perspective of a student's ability to conceptually understand math, to comprehend math concepts. That is something you need to be able to understand. Um, they still have procedural fluency. They should be skilled in carrying out procedures that are flexible, that are accurate, that are efficient, and that are appropriate. Um, they should be able to formulate, formulate, represent, and solve math problems. They should be able to have the capacity for logical thought, for reflection, for explanation, and justification. And, for, and also, in the end, I, I really like this one, a productive disposition. They should have a habitual inclination to see math as sensible, useful, worthwhile, and coupled with a belief in diligence and one's own efficacy. So you have to have confidence. You have to be confident and be able to use it every day. And that is the aim. And of course, that this is idealistic. But I, you know, for some people, this is this is very possible. So you know, essentially, the, the aim in the classroom, then, right, in the math classroom or in the AB classroom, should be to focus on these strands, and these are research-based strands from the National Research Council. And for what reason should adults use math? And then we have the answers from EFF. You should, adults should use math to understand. They should be able to understand it, apply it, define it, determine it, solve it, and communicate it. I can fly through this slide because we've had this one previously. But as you can see, when it's from the context of um, it's being equipped for the future, right? Equipped for the 21st century. It, it, it makes sense that adults at least should be able to apply uh, mathematics and communicate about it. And not only in the classroom, but in and out of the classroom. Now, as I said earlier, there are some directions of the U.S. Department of Education. And the reason I know is because I've been involved in some of the projects um, related to adult numeracy. Um, as I said earlier, there's a 2006, and this is just as a reminder, um, uh, new adult numeracy initiative, and I think that's where the drive came from. It's from that large project that produced um, a comprehensive lit review. Uh, it's an international lit, lit review of math practice over the world. And, um, and the current project we have now, we should be expecting something soon. I'm just, this is just summarizing here for you. Now, we know that the objective, right, the aim, the direction that the U.S. Department of Education wants to go in, they're developing the principles of adult numeracy instruction. Um, and, you know, well, the, develop the principles of adult numeracy instruction. There's a publication from the National Math Panel um, that identified gaps in adult numeracy research, and they're providing the blueprint for future work in adult numeracy. Well, actually, that document provided the blueprint, and that blueprint is now helping to shape professional development in numeracy. Um, so they're following, the new direction is that they're following the NRC definition, the National Research Council's definition of mathematics. Um, the aim is to show that mathematics, and when you do get to look, if you haven't have, had a chance to peek at it yet, but the the, 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 their approach to teaching math is that they, they say it's the purposeful integration of all math content, which math content areas, which would include number, geometry, algebra, data, and across different student levels. Um, there's this really strong aim um, towards communicating in math, right? Giving students the opportunity to talk about math, and not only in terms of math procedures, but what math is about, how they use it in their everyday life, um, and being able to connect with, to make connections um, within and outside of mathematics. And I can tell you also that um, McGraw-Hill will be developing some professional development on numeracy, on mathematical literacy that focus on this whole communication and connections piece. So there, there is some information coming out um, that's currently in the pipeline that should be available for, for um, adult education uh, teachers regarding how to teach math. Um, there are several, you know, the, the National Research Council uh, had this math learning study committee, and I think um, I, 
I wonder if it was something based on in Japan somewhere, but it involved a Japanese um, uh, practitioners, and they said in terms of when it comes to the teaching mathematics to adults, and when it comes to looking at what professional development should look like in teaching math for adults, there are four different approaches, right? There is the approach where a program simply focus on mathematics, right? So the trainers seek to develop teachers' proficiency with core content from ele elementary school math. Um, some professional development initiatives focus on students' thinking. They aim to see how are students thinking about math and then shape professional development that would help develop students' understanding of math. There are some that focus on cases, so they, they look at different uh, teachers the teacher practice uh, are teacher assignments. They look at students' work and develop cases to focus professional development initiatives. And there is also some who focus on le lesson study. I would say that it's up to the program. Again, we have to look at context to be able to determine. I, I think um, professional developers should look at context to, be, to, to determine you know, what approach should be taken to teach math, to, to, you know, to prepare teachers to teach math to adults. And these are just four approaches that currently use, I believe, in Japan. But it, again, it depends on the context. Um, numeracy assessments, when it comes to instructional and programmatic practices, I know that there are some real serious issues with the current content in numeracy that we have. Um, you know, what are best practices in a numeracy assessment? I, I think this is still a big question for everybody in the world. <laughs> I know that the, the TABE is skill-based, skill so it focuses on skill, and then the concept is competency-based. Um, both are valid, both claim to be valid, um, but there is no evidence of skill transfer, right? Do we know if, if students are transferring the skills that they learn in the math classroom onto the um, exam? Um, and then there is also very little research conducted on both of them within the context of adult education classroom, so it's really hard to tell um, whether or not that claim to validity is really um, a good claim. I'm not saying it's bad, I'm just saying those are just the issues. This is just the outstanding questions that are still, uh, still are there. Um, so it is difficult when if you do go and search online or do some re your own research, you'll find that it's difficult to look at publications, uh, I guess substantive publications related to adult numeracy assessment. Um, this topic is all, and then you'll find that it's always, you know, maybe if you search under adult literacy or something, you'll find some little piece that talks about math numeracy, but there is no real substantive work and that has been done, that focuses on, on the numeracy assessment. And so this is a, a tremendous area of need. Um, um, it's hardly discussed in, in, in the literature, for, for one. And I think it's a major issue. A lot of the research I've looked at says, we need to pay attention to adult numeracy assessments. And so far, no one has uh, really taken the time to, um, maybe perhaps they don't have the funding <laughs> to really be able to focus on that. Uh, so for now, we use the tape and the classes, and I'm sure there are classroom uh, assessments that are created. Uh, in terms of looking at instructional practice, studies of instructional practice in the context of adult education is rare, right? The study tends to show the focus on the K-12 perspective, and as we all know, the K-12 practice has shaped, to some extent, numeracy practice in adult education. And, and that is not necessarily a bad thing, but I don't think it's necessarily good either. I think um, there are principles and, uh, of, of adult learning, and some of the K-12 practice, sometimes you know, it's not transferable to the adult learning context. Um, OVA is currently conducting the Adult Numeracy Initiative, and I, I talked about that earlier. This, this is just a reminder. Um, and the practices there focus on math as an integrative activity. And I'm stressing the word integrative because when you leave this presentation, that's the word I want you to remember. <laughs> integrative and five strands. Uh, that, and that will put you on par with what's going on <laughs> in, in the, in the, with the federal government. Um, instructional practices, what teachers ought to do instruction, instructionally. 
Um, teachers need to purposefully integrate math concepts. Um, they need to promote communication in the math classroom, encourage students to converse about mathematics. Uh, teachers need to help students make connections within the classroom and outside of the classroom. Teachers also need to consider ethno mathematics. This is something I, I talked about earlier. There's a lot of research, and in, in, I think it's in Portugal, in Spain, and in Brazil on ethno mathematics and the idea that people who have never even been to school are able to compute, of course, in a different way than than you know the type of computation that are are practiced in the U.S. But um, what they found is the researchers who research ethnomathematics is that students, especially students from different countries, have different ways of solving math problems. And a lot of work in Brazil is done on fishermen who have never, um, I, I don't think, passed third grade. And, and there are some really interesting numeracy practice that they have that is systematic, that is, systematic, that is, 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 is real, that baffle. Uh, mathematicians, <laughs> you know, some people argue that math is into math is intuitive, and everyone is born with a math gene. So maybe that's what they're they're using here. Um, another issue is, is for teachers to encourage students to show what they know and be flexible. Because I think a lot of times students do not have the opportunity to practice math in the classroom. So if you encourage students to show what they know and be flexible with the different math procedures. I think you'll understand that students bring math to the classroom. They are not blank slates. They do bring um, a certain level of understanding of mathematics. It's probably different from how math is taught in the U.S. Uh, you know, I don't know if you hear my accent, but I'm from Grenada. And math <laughs> is taught slightly different there, um, and we're able to still come to the same answer. So I think teachers need to explore what these different answers are that students have in their minds about how to solve a math problem. I think that would just only add to the whole idea of communicating about math. Other instructional practice, what teachers ought to do, consider effective factors, right? Do students have math anxiety? Are they failing the test because they're just afraid of the math? <laughs> are they failing the test because they do not think they are confident. They're not confident. They don't have math confidence, I would argue. There are many people who have math disabilities, and dyscalculia is, is something. It's a it's mathematic disability, a calculation disability. Um, and this is studied a lot in, um, in northern Europe, in, in places like uh, Copenhagen, Denmark. Um, you know, there's a lot of work on dyscalculia, and I encourage you to take the opportunity to, to study that, to see that there is a possibility that there are just like students who have um, dyslex dyslexia and have difficulties reading, there are people who are unable to process mathematics, cal calculation and mathematics. And so that has implications for how far teachers are able to go with them. That has implications for teacher practice and teacher change. So it's something to really pay attention to. Um, Sometimes teachers have anxiety about mathematics. <laughs> they remember their third grade uh, teacher or something, and sometimes they're afraid because of their own anxiety that's transferred to the students in the classroom, and that, that's also a problem. Um, teachers ought to use in, in technology. We are in an age of technology, and I, I would venture to say, go ahead and use it. <laughs> Um, consider cooperative learning because this is the only this is a good way of helping students to communicate about mathematics. Consider discovery learning. Have students discover meaning. Do not give them all the answers. Have let them find it themselves. Remember they're adults. Um, consider student schema that goes back to ethno mathematics. A lot of the students in our classroom are students from other countries and other backgrounds. Um, what math do they bring to the classroom? And here again, implications for assessment, because how does the teacher know how to get that out of a student um, if we do not have the right resources in a math assessment to help them to do that? Um, in terms of instructional practices, uh, consider the learning experiences of students. And there are, I don't want to read this slide to you, because we only have five more minutes left. But think of, um, if you look in the far left side, you see natural, conflicting, and alien. Um, you know, practice, classroom practice that is natural. It fits the learner's mental structures, right? It helps, it's easy for them to process 
that kind of experience. But if it's consist conflicting, it, it, it is inconsistent with their mental structure. So, you know, we do long division a little differently than they do it in the U.S. And when I saw, when I first got into a U.S. classroom and saw how math was being done, I mean, it, it was very conflicting to me. It almost didn't make sense. So it didn't mean that I don't know how to do long division. It just meant that I had difficulty processing the way because that was very conflicting. It seemed almost contradictory to me. Um, so consider that when things might seem alien to your students, but, you know, which experiences sort of invoke those kind of feelings that learners bring to the classroom. I encourage you to look at Simpson and Dustin's work from 1995 um, regarding that. I can send you a bibliography, um, I'm sorry, a list of references that, you know, with all of this information. Um, so this all takes us to the fact that I've repeated over this presentation that um, the CalPRO model will be changed to reflect the federal initiative. Um, we're going to address the new directions that the U.S. Department of Education is taking. And we uh, will incorporate a more appropriate definition of numeracy in, in that module change. We know that there is still a clear need for more research in the U.S. There is a very, very high dependence on K-12 work. Um, there is just so, so, so much work that has been done in adult numeracy in other countries. And when we look at what the U.S. has done, it's incomparable by far. Um, there is a need for a more critical um, look at numeracy. Um, and the current work, a lot of it is based on practitioner wisdom. And the ANN has done some considerable work in adult numeracy as well. And these are the questions we still have outstanding. Despite all the research we've done, what can we learn about effective instruction from children's math education that can help adult education? What can we learn from the research on adult cognitive and math development? Because those are important areas of inquiry that still need to, uh, to, to be discussed. What can we measure? What ways can we measure the set of adult numeracy education? What is the role of affect in adult learning of numeracy? How can we improve teacher education and professional development in mathematics instruction? What about math and ESL? Like, how do you teach math and ESL students? Do we know that they have to know some math. Many of them are, you know, doctors and masters and engineers, and you know, they, some of many of them know math. You know, what can we learn regarding that? And the last question is, do you have any questions? And thank you so much. I must say before we do that, um, you know, for, for for listening to me. Okay, thank you so much, Anastine. Um, before we do move on to the questions, I just wanted to make sure that um, in case anybody needs to log off, because it is almost, uh, it is almost 1 o'clock, um, before you do log off, I'd like to ask everybody to look at the middle panel that's on your screen right now. And um, make sure to click on the link provided there to fill out an evaluation of the form. And you'll find in the middle of the screen as well uh, Barbara's email address if you would like a certificate of attendance. At the bottom of the screen uh, is the PowerPoint again if you would like to download that for your reference. And on the right side there are there's a link um, or there's a space for you to put in suggested research topics so that you have the opportunity to make suggestions of other things that you'd like to have webinars on in the future. And now, in a sense, I will turn it back over to you for any questions. Any questions, anyone? Let's see. Thank you. Um, and there were a few questions that I sent to you um, that I tried to capture oh. as we went through. I, I, I'm trying to scroll back, but I, I see one, how many of you believe preschool kids count quite often to themselves? I, I, I don't see the question that you said, Marcella. It's in the chat. It's in a, yeah, I don't see it. 
Uh, someone said anything when you refer to skill transfer, do you mean practical application in real life? Yes, that and also transfer from one strand to the next, right? So how do you transfer your knowledge of number sense to geometry or to algebra and that type of stuff? Uh, let's see, any other um, questions? Yeah. Another question, someone wanted some extra clarification on what you meant by ethnomathematics? Yeah, ethnomathematics is, is a math, math related to culture, how different cultures do mathematics differently. So it's math from a sort of an ethnic perspective. Um, we know that the Western world have a certain way of doing math, but there is a lot of research um, that show that people from different cultures do math differently. Even people who have never seen numbers, they've never seen the numbers in the, you know, uh, are able to do math in a different way and still come up with the same responses or the correct responses that one would find who have grown up in a society or a culture that uses numbers. Not all cultures use numbers as we know it, and, and many are able to get, come up with the same responses. Um, so math is really beyond numbers. It can, you know, as some ethnomathematicians would argue, um, it, it has cultural implications, and, and different cultures teach math differently. And, and often people would argue that they'll learn and process, cognitively process math differently. So you know, math to some extent is, is culture bound in some ways. Um, and the other question that. Um, yeah, the other question that someone had asked was how, uh, it, uh, the question was how does this approach compare to how math is taught in China? They are far ahead of us in this and technological areas. I'm not quite sure exactly what approach they were referring to, um, but yeah, if you want a, to. Yeah, that's a really, really, uh -huh. that's a really, really good question, and I think that would be, you know, another 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 research study we have to conduct. Um, I, I you know I think that you know the U.S. culture is so heterogeneous. You you find people from all sorts of different parts of the world in this culture and in, in, in primarily in the Western world. So you know I would imagine that because um, China has perhaps such a homogeneous culture that and and. Remember, education is shaped by a lot of, of different ways of life. Again, we can go back to culture. I think what happens in the classroom is reflective of what is occurring in society. I think society is at the top of the hierarchy, and social practices that are acceptable um, in society are often acceptable in the classroom. So when we look at how math is taught in Chinese, I think it, it would make sense to look at their sociocultural practices. Um, to get a sense of what that might look like. And then, you know, if you want to compare it to, you know, in the U.S., we're the land of the free, the land of the brave, and the land of opportunity. <laughs> so I think it's a slightly different. Our educating practices are reflective of those uh, principles of democracy. Um, and so um, you won't find these principles. I mean, in my country where I came from, of course I went to a Catholic school and it's slightly different, but flogging was allowed. If I didn't get the math, I would get a little flogging on my arm. <laughs> if I didn't pay attention, I was flogged. And that was just part of our culture, um, which is a highly sort of religious, you know, kind of culture there in Grenada. Um, of course, that changed after the invasion in 1983. We're now Americans, but <laughs> you can imagine how it was back in the, in the 70s. <laughs> Any other questions? Let's see. Any other questions? I believe that's all the questions that were asked throughout. Um, if anybody else has a question they would like to type in now and share with us, that would be Sometimes wonderful. Gustavo, is that a question that Gustavo has? Is there a link between reading skills and math skills? Uh, well, all I know is that there are confounding areas. Um, oftentimes, when we're talking about and that's done in a lot of research, and not only the U.S., but in England and, and in other parts of the world. Um, when a student demonstrates a problem in mathematics, how does a teacher know that it's not a reading problem? That is an outstanding and a very, very important question. Um, and what we know is that math, you know, in reading skills, developing reading skills, enable a student to also develop their mathematics skills. 
Because in order to communicate about mathematics, you have to be literate. You have to be able to read. And if you have difficulties reading, chances are there's a, a huge chance that you're going to have difficulties processing math problems. Mm -hmm. um, someone just posted a question on how they can find information to improve their teacher math skills. Um, and that relates to another question about how they can get the references from your presentation. Well, I will, I, I should have included them. Let's see, do I have them? I should have included them at the end of this, but it doesn't look like I did that. So I will send them to Barb, and she can forward it to, to everyone. And to more professional development, I will say check out OVA, the Office of Vocational Adult Education the website for information on the Adult Numeracy Initiative. You're going to find a very nice uh, math annotated bibliography and, and, and literature review there. I think that it, it, it's kind of thick, but it's worth looking through to get a sense of you know the monster that we're dealing with when we talk about numeracy and mathematical literacy. Um, I know that McGraw Hill, in uh, you know, I don't want to advertise for them, but I know that there is something coming out there um, sometime in September. So there are going to be some math modules that kind of focus exactly on what we talked about here today. Um, so it would be it would worth uh, you know you're, you're you're trying to get a hold of that <laughs> at some point um, when it comes out in the fall. Um, Check out the Adult Learning Math, and it's M-A-T-H-S, it's A-L-M, I believe it's A-L-M.org, but you will find the latest research internationally on Adult Learning Math. That's the name of the organization. I'm an editor for their journal, so I kind of get fresh, I mean, the latest research in mathematics. I would really, really encourage you to check them out, and I can also send Barb the link to send to you. Take a look at their journal, take a look at their website. Um, and you know, the, this is one of the first websites, uh, the first organizations that focus primarily, primarily on adult learning math internationally. It's not only in the United States, but internationally. So um, you, you see the different practices that, 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 are, that are there. Um, uh, and they have a, an international conference annually, and it's in a different country. This year it's in New Zealand. Um, next year it's going to be, you know, it's going to be somewhere else on the globe. So I, I, it's a good organization to join if you're interested in math and numeracy. Um, Ron talked, uh, in terms of research topics, Ron mentioned maybe something more specific on uh, integrated techniques. And you're definitely going to see that coming out on integrated techniques. Is that that's what's coming out in the, in the new professional development um, training that the Department of Education is, is doing now with uh, that company in Boston that I told you about. So something is coming. Um, Nancy, I think the last question uh, that we'll be covering today um, someone asked about uh, in math anxiety in our students mm -hmm. and what we can do to lower their math anxiety. Some research shows that students have math anxiety when they are unable to process math vocabulary. I would think that that's one of the pro probably the best way to start is to break down the vocabulary in the math. It, it, you know, because that that kind of terrifies students. So when you ask a student you know, some kind of complicated math question that has a big word in there <laughs> and they're having difficulties with English or just with literacy to begin with, then, you know, the, the, those words can, can have implications for their ability to process the math problem. And if they can't process the problem, they're going to get a kind of, you know, anxious. So I think vocabulary would be absolutely the thing you want to start off with to help lower their, their anxiety. And show them that you are not the arbiter of knowledge, about math knowledge. And that's where the communication come in, right? You're not the arbiter of knowledge, so you can discover math with them together and talk about math. I think that really helps when, you know, the, the, the student sees the teacher as, as someone who knows math, you know, but someone who may not know all the math in the world, <laughs> you know. So I think that can, you know, and, and don't overburden them with tests, right? 
a standardized test, a very structured sitting, quiet, and taking test. I think there are other ways to um, assess their knowledge without putting paper in front of them and having them be quiet and, and, and focus downward. <laughs> I think adults need to talk about math more than they need to stare at paper that contains math. Yes, it can be scary, <laughs> indeed. But I think making a list of vocabulary for your students, that would, that's, that, that would do magic for them. I would start off, if I were a math teacher, with starting off with vocabulary. Uh, before we begin the math class, here are some vocabulary words that we need to know before we move forward. I think that would help break down a lot of barriers for them. Okay, Aniston, thank you so much. Um, and thank you to everyone who is still online up for participating in this webinar. I hope you all found it very informative. Um, again, if you haven't had the chance to yet, please fill out the evaluation form and send your request to Barbara at bcrothers at AIR.org if you'd like a certificate of attendance. Thanks so much.